كيف يمكن للمرء أن يسجل الماضي عن فلسطين عندما لا تزال آلة الحرب والموت الإسرائيلية تضيف يوميا المزيد من أجساد وضحايا من أجساد وضحايا لا تعد ولا تحصى؟ يبدو هذا السؤال الذي طرحه البروفيسور حاتم بزيان في مقال النكبة رواية حكاية الفلسطينيين الغير الموجودين في التاريخ يبدو وكأنه يسيطر في كل مرة على جميع أفكار الكاتب كلما أراد تجميعها وترجمتها إلى قصة أو رواية أو مقال عن جانب من جوانب معاناة الفلسطينيين سواء على المستوى المحلي أو الإقليمي أو العالمي تلك الرواية التي يرى بزيان أن فصولها يستحيل أن تكتمل دون الحديث عن آلاف الأسرى الفلسطينيين الذين يقبعون داخل سجون الاحتلال تعسفيا فقط لأنهم من عشاق الكرامة والحرية ابن نابلس إحدى أكبر المدن الفلسطينية والقلب الاقتصادي النابض توقف بزيان عند مهزلة بيع وشراء حقوق اللاجئ الفلسطيني كما سلط الضوء في كثير من كتاباته على معاناة الفلسطينيين تحت نير الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وسلبه لأراضيهم وممارسة أبشع أنواع العنف بحقهم حتى جعلت ندبات هذا العنف هيئات الفلسطينيين الشابة مصابة بالشيخوخة نتيجة الاختناق من الاحتلال إضافة إلى انتزاع الأراضي ونقاط التفتيش ناهيك عن المستوطنين الفاشيين الذين يدوسون على كل شيء له معنى بما في ذلك الإنسان نفسه على حد تعبير البروفيسور حاتم بزيان غاص بزيان كبير المحاضرين في قسم الشرق الأدنى والدراسات العرقية في جامعة كاليفورنيا في صورة فلسطين عالميا تلك الصورة التي تنقلها الصحافة الغربية دوما بعدسة إسرائيلية ليتم التعامل مع فلسطين على أنها غير موجودة وعلى كل ما سبق وزيادة نجتمع اليوم لنناقش إصدار حاتم بزيان الجديد وهو الكتاب المعنون بفلسطين هي أمر استعماري Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming today We are very happy to receive you today for the presentation of Mr. Hatem Bazian's latest book which is called Palestine, It is Something Colonial My name is Nour al-Zaman Abu Sha'ir I will be your main host today I will be assisted by Mr. Abul Hassan, who will moderate the discussion. Today's event is the result of collaboration between many organizations, which will be introduced to you later. In his book, Hatem Bazian asserts that Palestine is the last settler colonial project to be commissioned in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and is unfold and is still unfolding today. His position is that the event from the late 19th century up to the present can best be understood from a settler colonial perspective. At the case of Palestine has many similar features to classical colonial, <coughs> colonialism. Sorry. We are of course very grateful to Hatem for being with us. Hatem Bazian is the founder and national chair of American Muslims for Palestine. He is a decolonial Islamic thinker and founder of the Islamophobia Research and Documentation Project. Furthermore, he is a professor of Near Eastern and Asian American Studies and Asian Diaspora Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. And finally, he is the co-founder and professor of Islamic Law and Theology at Zaytuna College, which is the first accredited Islamic liberal arts college in the USA. Hatem will take care of the main part of our program. We also thank Mr. Sandu Hera for agreeing to comment on Hatem's book from a decolonial perspective. Sandu will be introduced properly after the break. The program is as follows. Hatem will present the content of his book, after which there will be time for questions. Then we have a short break, and after the break, we continue with comments from Mr. Sandu Hera and another round of discussion in which both Hatem and Sandu will participate. I hope you enjoy the program. I wish you an inspiring afternoon. And for now, please let, join me welcoming Mr. Hatem Bazian. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, uh, let me thank 
Noor and uh, everyone for being here today with uh, us in this program. Uh, I was asked first to give a short Arabic intro for people who are joining us online. Uh, so I'm not saying anything that is secret, it's just to convey salams and intro to those with us online and then I'll proceed with uh, discussing the main uh, points in my book. أولاً نريد أن نرحب مع كل المشاهدين الذين هم معنا الآن عبر الإنترنت هذا مما يقرب الأزمنة ويقرب المساحات والمسافات اليوم أريد أن نناقش معكم الكتاب الجديد الذي نزل في السوق منذ أسبوعين عنوان الكتاب فلسطين هي أمر استعماري عنوان الكتاب أصلا يأتي من رسالة طرحها هيرتزل إلى سيس الراد الذي كان هو وزير المستعمرات أو وزير الاستعمار البريطاني في أواخر القرن الماضي ليطلب بداية لمشروع إنشاء دولة لليهود في فلسطين ف الكتاب أساسا يريد أن يؤرخ بداية الحملة الاستعمارية لفلسطين وما هي المبادئ التي اتخذت لتأصيل هذا البرنامج الذي لا يزال نشاهد ما يقام به من تشريد من بناء مستعمرات من قتل من دمار وهذا كله مرتبط في تركيبة الحملة الاستعمارية عنوان الكتاب أيضا يريد أن يزيل النقاش عن محور فقط المتعلق في فكرة أزلو وأن هذه الفكرة قللت أو قلصت من مساحة القضية الفلسطينية عامة هذا الكتاب يريد أن يسرد قصة فلسطين بمحتوى تاريخ أكبر وأطول فلا أريد أن أطيل الكلام في اللغة العربية لوجود ضيوف هنا أتوا ليسمعوا المحاضرة أساسا باللغة الإنجليزية ولكن إن شاء الله في المستقبل الكتاب سيطرح في اللغة العربية وممكن أن يكون في متداول الناس في العالم العربي وأيضا في مناطق أخرى ف Shukran li istimaakum wa tawajidikum ma'ana abar al-internet. So now I'll go back to uh, my English presentation and uh, to focus on the book and uh, the main themes that are contained. Now let me begin by first saying or saying something about the title of the book because it's, uh, it's important it contains the uh, message that is uh, being formulated in relation to the book. Uh, Palestine, it is something colonial. The subtext of the title is taken directly from Theodore Herzl's letter uh, that he wrote to Cesar Rhodes. Uh, Cesar Rhodes was Minister of Colonies uh, of Great Britain, and Herzl wrote a letter seeking Great Britain adoption of the Zionist program. And Herzl is posing the question, why do I turn to you, referencing or speaking to uh, Cecil Rhodes? He answered, or Herzl said, because it is something colonial. So Herzl from the onset, and the Zionist movement from the onset, considered and saw its program as part of a colonial project to unfold in partnership or in uh, uh, cooperation with a major power. In this case, it was Great Britain. Now, Herzl attempted uh, to strike a deal with other powers during the same time period. Uh, he actually tried to have a deal struck with the Russians, Tsarist Russia, uh, and uh, his attempts at Tsarist Russia was not taken seriously. He actually also went to try to strike a deal with the Ottomans, uh, visiting uh, Istanbul uh, during the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid. 
uh, trying to get Sultan Abdul Hamid to grant a land uh, right uh, to the Zionist movement to uh, begin developing a homeland uh, in Palestine. And likewise, uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid rebuffed the idea and did not grant him uh, this uh, request uh, upon his visit. And finally, the attempt uh, with Great Britain. Now, in Zionist literature, there were many other areas that the Zionists were considering. So by no means, uh, Palestine was the only location. Uh, there were discussions of other areas uh, to be possibly a location for the uh, establishment of a homeland, uh, with the Zionist movement seeking this intervention. What I tried to do in trying to locate Palestine as a colonial project is to step out of the daily discussion revolving around Palestine that is focused on whether we oppose a settlement, whether we are discussing the apartheid wall, whether we are right now calling for lifting the siege on Gaza. All those are important, but these are the symptoms of the larger colonial project that has been set in place in the early part of the 20th century and continues to unfold. This gets us into the broader discussion about what Israeli and Zionist uh, uh, framing is constantly to create facts on the ground. Creating facts on the ground is constantly moving the line of demarcation and the facts of the ground also I extend it to say legal facts on the ground. That every time that there is an aspect that Israel engages in, it creates a new legal framing that pushes the boundaries of the, of the settler colonial project forward. And instead of going back to focus on settler colonialism, we begin to focus on the new legal facts on the ground or the legal boundaries that are constructed. So it's important in here as we reframe uh, Palestine as a settler colonial project, it is to also begin to understand the processes by which uh, the legal framing is constructed and the facts on the grounds constructed that continues to push the boundaries farther and farther away from the actual settler colonial project itself. In here, the settler, the settler colonial project in Palestine begins actually with the targeting of the Ottomans. Uh, the chapter that I have is dissecting the Ottomans and colonizing Palestine is an important one. Uh, not only in relations to Palestine, but most of the conflicts that today we see in the area that is referred to as the Middle East, and may I remind you that there is no such thing as the Middle East, this is only the framing of Europe in relations to territory, either close to it, which is Near East, Middle East, and the Far East. This is only a Eurocentric delineation of the territory outside of Europe. But in general, many of the conflicts that we see in the region today are still uh, those that came as a result of the dissecting and the collapsing of the Ottoman, uh, of the Ottoman territory. Uh, the attempt to dismantle the Ottomans uh, had almost a 250-year project uh, that European colonial powers were engaged in. Uh, what was referenced as the sick man of Europe was a reference to the Ottomans with both uh, the French, the British, and at times the Portuguese and others attempting to claim uh, territories that belongs to the Ottoman. This culminated with uh, the success of dismantling the Ottomans in the First World War. In here I tend to mention uh, or spend some time on what's called the Great Arab Revolt. Uh, the Great Arab Revolt was not great nor was it Arab. The uh, Great Arab Revolt was a project that was put forth by the British intelligence, a person named T.E. Lawrence, and I have very, uh, I insist not to call him T.E. Lawrence of Arabia as Hollywood have labeled him Lawrence of Arabia. He does not belong to Arabia. He belongs to 10 Downing Street. He was an intelligence officer that came out of the Egyptian uh, colonial office of, Egypt, uh, of the British uh, colonial enterprise. He forwarded the idea of fomenting an Arab revolt 
uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, in Al Hijaz, as a way to try to uh, disrupt the Ottoman uh, line of support and supply in the Hijaz Railroad, and in doing so would allow and permit the British troops uh, to land on the Palestine coast, on the Mediterranean, as well as uh, arrive from the southern uh, section of Egypt through the Sinai. Uh, by disrupting the supply route and disrupting the Ottomans, uh, it would be much easier to actually colonize and take over Palestine uh, directly. So the, what came to be known as the Great Arab Revolt, again, was an intelligence operation, not dissimilar to the intelligence operation that now, in 2003, resulted in the invasion of Iraq under the dubious claim of weapons of mass destruction uh, and the dubious claim that Saddam Hussein constituted a threat uh, in general, and that was a fomented campaign in the same way the Great Arab Revolt was as such. The second goal of the revolt was that the British and French troops at the time had large number of Muslim soldiers that were recruited from the colonies. And in order for uh, those troops to be mollified and to uh, feel that they're engaging in a war sanctioned under Islamic pretext, they needed a fig leaf of Islamic support. And this came by the uh, uh, Sharif Hussein of Mecca, who was a descendant from the family of the Prophet, declaring the revolt. And thus, many of the Indian troops in particular, and those from the Indian subcontinent, uh, felt that they're at ease to engage in the fight against the Ottomans. So there were two simultaneous goals uh, that came as a result of this revolt. It is during this period that also we witnessed the British uh, multiple strategies, uh, multiple colonial strategies, if I may say. One, they promised the territories to be, a ter to be governed by Sharif Hussein as the new caliph. And we have the correspondence between Sharif Hussein and the British, where the British are promising that at the end of the First World War, they will grant all these territories that were part of the Ottoman uh, uh, provinces, the Arab provinces, to be declared a new state, to be governed by a new caliph. This is actually the British accepting to declare a new caliph, and Sharif Hussein would be the new caliph on uh, these territories. Simultaneously, during the same time period, the British issued the Balfour Declaration. Uh, on November 2nd, 1917, the British issued the Balfour Declaration, promising Palestine up to the railroad, the Hijaz railroad, uh, to the Zionist movement. Third, the British and the French were actually engaging in secret meetings uh, and came up with what is known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement, dividing the uh, territories, the Ottoman territories between them, a sphere of influence for the British and a sphere of influence for the French. Simultaneously, a fourth promise is that territories that will be supposedly liberated from the Ottomans will be given self-determination and self-rule. Uh, if there is a such thing that the British can speak from four sides of their mouth without actually committing to any, uh, this is, was the case in the sense of having four dubious strategies simultaneously in a normative settler colonial approach relative to uh, the end of the First World War. So as such, Zionism emerges into the fold as part of the machinery of British colonialism and being facilitated as one of the stepping stones on this. Let me stop a little bit on the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration itself was put forth by the British specifically for their own strategic interest. Uh, the British were thinking of their colonial possession in India, and that India has a natural border on the north, a mountainous terrain, that defends India from a possible Russian invasion. And therefore, India, from the British perspective, was a secure territory uh, as a colonial possession. Egypt, on the other hand, which was directly colonized by the British in 1882, uh, did not have defensible borders on the north, and 
it is a possibility that the Ottomans will be able to reclaim the territory if an invasion from the north, it will be very flat. And also a possible sea uh, invasion might result likewise in undermining the British control, especially that the Suez Canal has already been opened and is a vital strategic trade route for the British and in general for Europe. So the idea was to create a buffer state, and that's how the homeland or creating a Jewish state in Palestine was seen to as a protection and a buffer state for the British strategically. The second goal, and this is the irony of all irony, is that the, many of those who supported the Balfour Declaration in the British uh, government were themselves actually extremely anti-Semitic. Uh, in the later part of the 19th century and to the early part of the 20th century, there were migration, Jewish migration from Eastern Europe uh, into uh, Western Europe, including uh, England itself and London. There were a greater number of Jews in London that many of these political elites uh, were essentially seeing that there are too many Jews around and extreme anti-Semitism became the norm not dissimilar to the discussions and the discourse here where there are too many Muslims around and we're beginning to see the Islamophobia that is almost identical to the anti-Semitism. Uh, just if you, if you take the literature of the later part of the 19th century, early 20th century, take the same language that was directed at the Jewish populations in parts of Europe and you remove Jewish and both Muslims, you will see exactly the same type of sentiments that were present in there. So. Balfour himself was a known anti-Semite, uh, the, the, the person who the declaration uh, bears his name. Uh, it was an idea of actually removing the Jews from Europe to solve Europe's Jewish question. And I would like to stop at this notion, the Jewish question. Uh, the Jews don't have a question, it's actually it's Europe's question, which is Europe's inability to live with the other. And the long history of Europe, its inability to live with the other religiously and also racially. So when any, anyone that poses the question in relations to an ethnic or religious group, framing it to say the Jewish question, or I also, because I do a lot of work on Islamophobia, to say the Muslim question, that itself is not the question of the subject, is the person who's posing the question, the problem is in them and they need to go to a 12-step program to begin to deal with that question itself. So in essence, we have to see the framing of the Balfour Declaration in exact terms that it came out of anti-Semitism, uh, of Europe's inability to actually deal and contend with uh, one of the normative parts of European history, which is the constant demonization and otherization of the Jewish subject, but also going back to 1492, the Muslim subject in relations to Europe and how European identity uh, gets to be crafted. So again, this just goes into the discussions around the early formation and early development of uh, uh, Zionism and its partnership with uh, the British. When we speak about colonialism, we have to make a distinction between colonialism and settler colonialism. Palestine is facing settler colonialism, not the regular colonialism. Again, speaking from the Dutch perspective, the Dutch engaged in colonialism, where you had a colonial motherland and going out to different territories, claiming those territories for natural resources, right? uh, precious metal, gold, taking these raw materials, bringing them to the motherland, manufacture them into refined products, and send them back to the colonies or also other markets to be sold. That's just the regular type of colonialism that, again, the Dutch were engaged in it, the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italians, the Germans, right? So that was, settler, that was colonialism. Settler colonialism is a different type. Even though that some of the populations come from Europe and settle those territories, when they settle those territories, they claim those territories as theirs because sometimes they're actually pushed out, right? 
from the colonial motherland. Uh, for example, if you think of Australia, some of the undesirables from England, prisoners, were sent in there. So basically being an Australia, you're, that's your life sentence. So you begin to claim that territory. Or in relations to the United States, again, escaping the U.S. for uh, fear of religious persecution in Europe. And therefore, the claim is that they went to the United States and they began to claim uh, the, uh, the Americas as their own. And that becomes settler colonialism. What is distinctive of settler colonialism is that they have no use for the indigenous population. The indigenous population is an impediment to a settler colonial claim. Right? So, for example, thinking of the Americas, this is the most successful settler colonial program or project. Australia is also one of the most successful settler colonial project because the indigenous populations were put to genocide. Right? And those who remained in relations to the United States in particular are put in reservations. Right? So that's a settler colonial project. The land needed to be claimed and the population, the indigenous population that was there was an impediment to the settler colonial project. In South Africa, it was a settler colonial project likewise. And because of the large number of blacks that sometimes they were recruited to work, they were pushed into five homelands to concentrate and they engaged in the second dimension, which is to transfer. So genocide is the more preferable because you eliminate the indigenous population. The second, if the numerical numbers are still have an impasse, then the, the second option is transfer, which is transfer the indigenous population from one side or one territory or most favorable land and to claim those lands. In Palestine, we have a settler colonialism that opted for transfer. So the transfer project, which we see actually almost active even till today, uh, uh, Lieberman, the current foreign minister of Israel, is actually favors transfer. He actually wants to transfer the Palestinians from the West Bank, in particular. He wants to transfer them to Jordan. And he constantly say that there is a Palestinian state. It's called Jordan. That's a settler colonialism right, that exactly engages in dispensing of the indigenous population by means of a transfer project, similar to what happened in South Africa, transferring South African blacks into the homeland. So that distinction is important to know in relations to the distinction between colonialism and settler colonialism. Colonial colonials projects in general also use religious justification and rationalization. Right? And this is in the chapter that I call, it's the biblical uh, theology of dispossession. Uh, it's interesting that every colonial project used God to justify uh, the fact they actually dispossess an indigenous population. And the thing is that uh, no one can actually call God. You don't have it, an iPhone app to actually click and say, God, did you actually authorize somebody to dispossess my land? Every colonial project used religious justification to colonize and dispossess the population. This is what's called Manifest Destiny uh, that was utilized. And as such, the biblical theology of dispossession reads the religious text as a dispensation for engaging in a colonial project. In Palestine, we see it very clearly so, in a sense of using the biblical text as a document to dispossess the population. And usually when you speak and argue and debate Zionists, once they are unable to actually argue the facts, then they resort to what you call the trump card, not the president, but they say God promised us the land. Once you say that, meaning all debate and discussion is mute because you cannot, again, use an app to verify whether actually somebody actually gave that promise to authorize dispossession, expulsion, and so on. So the biblical theology of dispossession is an important one. And in here, we also link to the expanding Christian 
uh, right, Christian coalition, rapture theology, not all Christianity, but those with extreme right and rapture theology, where actually part of their theology is there has to be a creation of a state of Israel as a stepping stone for the return of Jesus. And therefore, part of this alliance that takes place uh, between Zionism on the one hand and the extreme Christian right, rapture theologians, uh, it's a shotgun wedding, if you're going to actually say that, but it's taking place because of the distorted notions of how the biblical text is read and what is being thought of in relations to Palestine. So it's preparation for the second coming. This gets us into a broader notion that I was a little bit of it, but maybe later on, is the distinction between imperial religion, a religion that constructs itself in imperial terms, versus religion that is more of the grassroots, more of liberation uh, for the poor, the dispossessed, and so on. We often correlate religion with power. That God is on my side if I'm powerful, and therefore we assume that God is essentially is coming with a tank, an F-16, a missile, because we actually are thinking of imperial religion than religion per se. And I often say that if we take the question of the three prominent figures in the Abrahamic tradition, if Muhammad, Jesus, and Moses were around, were they being salesmen for the military industrial complex, or will they be protesting and be in the forefront of changing and pressuring to alter the priorities that we have, considering that we are spending $1.4 trillion a year uh, on military expenditures globally. So again, this is the imperial religion and how we construct it versus religion that is a liberation that liberates the individuals and society in general. So that's part of uh, the discussions on the biblical theology of dispossession uh, in general. In, 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 I don't want to go into each of the chapters, but a critical chapter for me is Zionism, a Eurocentric uh, colonial epistemic. When we said that uh, Great Britain adopted, Zion, adopted Zionist project, adopted Zionism out of anti-Semitism, uh, Zionism itself saw itself as engaging in replicating the successful building of a nation-state project in Europe. And as such, they wanted to give birth to the new Jewish person in the, mo in the modern world. So Zionism is a reformist movement within traditional classical Judaism, moving away from the text and the historical foundations and boundaries within rabbinical and classical Judaism, and adopting nationalism, and also believing in power and might as the foundation for bringing into modernity the new Jewish person. And we could see this, in a sense, by saying one of the statements that was said in relation to Zionism is that it's by means of fire and the sword that Zion would rise, not by means of the book. And therefore, the birthing of a new, modern, powerful Jewish person into this contemporary period involves a matrimony between the individual and the land, replicating in their imaginary what occurred during the uh, period of David or Solomon's state. And here I'm using the state in uh, a, not in the contemporary discussions or contemporary framing, but in the classical framing. So in essence, there needed to have a marriage between the individual that was coming into modernity, being strengthened and powerful, claiming their place in the modern period and the land in order to give a new reality to the new Jewish person who was problematized for being suffering throughout history. So in essence, it's a move away from its own history of Jewish history and embracing Eurocentricity, which essentially Eurocentricity based on nationalism and also the ability to have total domination over the material. So in this sense, we have to understand it as part actually of Eurocentric thought rather than as it's often being contemplated or being projected as being part and parcel of Judaism because it's by no means a representation of 
Judaism at all, but rather a new modern phenomena vested in nationalism and vested in colonial discourse. As such, one has to assert that Zionism, rather than being defeating anti-Semitism, is actually accepted anti-Semitism as the norm and a point of departure. Which means that we have to critique the fundamental framing that Zionism is not a national liberation movement, because it did not liberate the Jewish person in Europe. It has actually opted to move out of Europe to dispossess the Palestinians as an indigenous population in partnership with the anti-Semites, rather than actually challenging the basic <coughs> assumption of anti-Semitism. And therefore, this is the irony of all irony, that it actually Judaism, uh, Zionism accepted to be the junior partner with the anti-Semitic European powers, colonial powers, in order to come into a position of influence and prominence in the modern period. And this is a pro an important critique that we need to challenge and push back when uh, speaking about Zionism and its place uh, in general. Now I want to leave some more time for discussions and questions in general. When we speak about the Nakba, right, uh, Benny Morris actually in one of the interviews uh, that he has uh, a long interview, he actually speaks about the Nakba as justifiable ethnic cleansing. Right? And in one statement he says that you don't make an omelet without cracking eggs. Now in here, Benny Morris uh, has to be challenged on the basic framing that he's accepting and essentially giving support to the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. And there's a distinction between saying it happened and uh, it's unfortunate versus saying it's justifiable ethnic cleansing because again, post the Holocaust, it seems that whatever could be accomplished and pushed forth could be justified by framing it as a response or as an answer to the consequences of the Holocaust. The, the, the immediate answer to this is the Holocaust was not the initiator of the uh, Zionist project. The Zionist project almost was 50 years before that. So the framing of the Holocaust as a rationale should be dispensed with and not engaged. The second aspect in here is that the justifiable ethnic cleansing is that basically saying that the Jewish population in Palestine had no other choice or had no other uh, recourse other than to engage in uh, the ethnic cleansing in order to bring about a, a Jewish state which they were hoped for. The reality is that there are many other options, there are many other possibilities, but they opted for the choice of creating an exclusive state at the moment of the crafting or the uh, issuing of Resolution 181 uh, of uh, the United Nations. Uh, when the United Nations passed Resolution 181, the Jewish state to be had almost equal population, 50% Arab, 50% Jewish. This is not all of historical Palestine, is that the area that was designated to be a Jewish state. So in essence, the ethnic cleansing was a strategy and a policy of choice in order to bring about a decisively Jewish majority state. Ironically enough, almost 70 years thereafter, Israel today is still facing the same question, whether it's able to extricate itself from the desire or the hope to have an exclusive Jewish state, or will it be able to live with people and population that are not Jewish, meaning the Palestinians. So it's not the Palestinians that have a problem with living with the other, quote, but rather Zionism from its inception wanted to create a pure state. That purity is not tenable. It was not tenable in 1948, and today it's not tenable even in Israel 1948 area because increasingly about 27 to 28 percent of the population of Israel itself is Palestinian. And literally by the time you get into two, 2040, the population in Israel will be equal, 50 percent Palestinian, 50 percent uh, Palestinian Muslim Christian, 50% Jewish in 48. Today, in historical Palestine, population is 50% Jewish, 50% Palestinian Christian and Muslim. Today, 
There's 12.6 million in historical Palestine. Half of it is Jewish and half of it is uh, Palestinian Christian Jews. So the desire to have an exclusive state in a settler colonial framing is not tenable, and therefore Benny Morris, not only that he's wrong historically, but he also wrong contemporarily, because he's unable to extricate himself from a historically distorted notion of trying to create a purely Jewish state, and he is actually rationalizing ethnic cleansing. And the question, again, for him as a historian, is that when he's reading the facts, and he's reading the research, he's opting to actually set the facts and the research right, and only contemplate and issue his statements ideologically. And I think that is the major challenge for us today in terms of how to confront and continue to deal with Zionism. Is Zionism able to actually move out of the colonial framing? And is the state of Israel itself is able to uh, set aside its colonial legacy and reach an understanding that colonialism cannot be sustained and it's not sustainable relative to Israel and relative to the Palestinians. My last conclusion, I don't try to contemplate a solution. I offer the six frames of how the uh, question of Palestine and the issue of Palestine is approached. I do favor the one state solution by, because of all the consideration is there. Again, the 12.6 million people that share historical Palestine. And I think we have to be creative in trying to approach a way for us to address the conflict and to try to arrive at a solution. Uh, the conclusion is not by all means a working out of what a one state solution looks like, but definitely looking at the five other approaches to Palestine, I think the one state solution today is the most logical and the most humane for us to move forward. The other alternative, again, in one of the other five is to fight it until God sorts it out. And there's definitely there is enough people that are calling for, for this, and there is enough weapons in the world that could keep us going for the next 200 years. And the military industrial complex is happy. Whether Jesus comes back or not, they're actually going to be running to the bank. So again, the alternative is what we need to look at. The alternatives are there, but they're almost a dead end doors. Uh, that we're looking at. And if, again, South Africa could be used as a model, even a problematic model, that's what we're, uh, the possibilities, what we need to consider at this particular time. So thank you and look forward to your questions uh, on this. Thanks.